Good afternoon, people, and here's a story on Games Radar about David Gator. And this is in response to all the hoopla regarding the Snyder Cut. What if there were other productions out there not related to movies, but say video games, where creators or, de or developers or producers were allowed to release all the extra content or do all the things they wanted to do in the project scope, regardless of budget and time. And if you don't know Dragon Age 2, it was rushed out the door rather quickly. They had to cut a lot of things. They had to skimp on resources and quality. And that's why we got the experience we did. So visually, audially, gameplay wise, uh, level design wise, the reused asset of the cave, for example. So lots of things were uh, done for efficiency sake, not for quality sake. So here's what David Gator had to say about Dragon Age 2. And I've talked about Dragon Age 2 a lot. I think the dialogue is good. The overall plot is garbage. And a lot of mechanics are either left out to dry or just not really developed well. So uh, here he goes. Um, I'm willing to bet Mark Dare or Laidlaw or anyone else on the team would give very different answers, but it's enough to save a Silverman pause because that was the project of multiple regrets. Ooh, wow. Although he's very proud of it, of course. A fantastic game hidden under a mountain of compromises, cut corners, and tight deadlines. I think that was the fastest game uh, outside of, I think, Mass Effect 2, perhaps? I think Dragon Age 2 was the fastest game to have come out in the uh, in the saga of Bioware popular games or popular franchises. Either So here's his wish list. Either restore the progressive changes to Kirk while we'd planned over the passing of in-game years. So there's two time skips in Dragon Age 2, and I believe it's three years each. And he wanted to have more updates to what happened to the to the world of Kirkwall, the city of Kirkwall, and all the inhabitants and the the the, the plots, the the design, um, maybe some of the people. There's could have been all sorts of things they would have planned, but that would involve a lot of assets and a lot of uh, branching of narratives. So maybe maybe that might be too much, or so he's, he's saying, hey, do this or this. Don't do both because it's too complicated. So he actually understands that element. And he's just the writer. He's just a guy who says, okay, I want this story to go this way with this character and this plot. He's like, okay, fine. If I can't do that, let's try this. So he's, he's always there to compromise, which a good writer should because you should never be limited by one idea. You should be able to be flexible with all your ideas, especially your words as well. So his second idea is, or reduce the time between acts to months instead of years. Now, that's not that big a deal, but I've argued that before that the the time skips are way too big and they have real no real relevance. I believe the one time skip is when Hawk gets acquainted and the other one is with the, the Deep Roads, I think. It doesn't take three years for Hawk to become acquainted or to, to go from A to B, from the Deep Roads and back. That was a big part of the plot, but it shouldn't have taken years and the aftermath have been a weird time skip of nothing where not much happens. So they, they, it should have been a, a more progressive approach because whenever you cut to another scene, any frame of time can be within a second, a month, a week, a year, who knows, until the, 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 the narrative tells us. So you have to explain why there's a three-year time skip. What is the relevance? You can't just have three years or 10 years or one week. What's the value of the time skip? Because if there's no value, why not just make it one day or travel time or, or sleeping time or coma time or whatever the case may be to explain why this change happened, to develop the setting, to develop the world more, to keep your characters out of it for it to be a new thing. Like what's What's the concern? That's the that's the question anyone would have, or else you're wasting everyone's time, or rather you're making things silly just by having a time skip of some unknown amount. The goal here would to make would be to make Kirkwall feel like a bigger city, and that's more crowded and more alive. Okay, so he wants the actual setting to have more moving parts, to have more characters in it, or NPCs, more developed buildings, perhaps, different design. I remember they scrapped that idea for Dragon Age Inquisition based on the type of fort you wanted to make. It was more spy-like or more military-like. Stuff like that would be nice, 
but that's more of a asset aspect, not a storytelling aspect. So I guess he's approaching this more from a game development approach as opposed to a develop or, or a writer approach where what did Hawk do? Like when he became a noble, did that change thing? When he when he became a champion, did that change things? To me, I don't remember a darn thing that changed aside from people calling you champion, which is useless. You want title and you want authority to go with that title. You want to be able to do something with that newfounded development. Oh, you're the champion of Kirkwall. What does that give you? Nothing aside from people calling you a name. It should have had more authority. It should have had more political influence. And we never got that. And that was part of what was advertised, I believe, from one of the trailers. So, in a more specific narrative space, Gator would also like to restore a plot point where Hawk, as a mage, came this close to becoming an abomination since he's the only mage who apparently never struggles with this. And Gator says that this subplot especially was a hard cut. Now, this is kind of funny. This has been an ongoing joke with, uh, I would say, most of the Dragon Age series but especially in two, because there's a big talk about blood magic, and that was part of Meryl's subplot. Um, I don't think Anders had that. I'm trying to remember. But it was a big thing with the, the Templars. And here's Hawk, the champion of Kirkwall, if you're a mage, running around, and you could specialize in blood magic. And you could literally fight in the streets and pull out the, the life force from fallen foes or your friends even, depending on how you upgraded your your, your blood magic and have this energy source just suck into you. And all the all the, the Templars are like, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> eh, it's just blood magic. We know it's blood magic. That's okay, Hawk. <laughs> You're totally fine doing that. So that, that should have been a really big deal, connecting the narrative with gameplay and having some negative repercussions of you choosing to be a blood mage. Because I'm sure if they did that, they would have way different gameplay mechanics and bonuses to doing that as well as reactions from NPCs and plot points saying, oh my God, did you just suck the life out of that guy? That's illegal. Uh, you're, you're an abomination, etc., etc." So there's all these wonderful, wonderful stories. And connect that with, Mer- with Mer- uh, sorry, not Meredith, but uh, Meryl's side story, that would have been great. So all these little inclusions. Now that's a lot of work, of course, but those are the kinds of choices we want to see if you want to go down that route which the narrative allows you, or the gameplay allows you to do. So I can understand where Gator is coming from, but that's a lot of work right there. Okay. Here's a tweet by David Gator. DA2 was a project where my writing team was firing on all cylinders and they wrote like the wind because they had to. Second draft, plot reviews. (laughs) That's sad to hear, but it's also amazing to, to hear that they got this thing accomplished. I was so proud of what we accomplished in such a brief time. I didn't think it was possible. Now, this is a great, this is a great quote. I think from Gator. No matter whether you like his, his writing or his work, the the best memories you have, of anything, is when you're pushed, to perform. You're pushed on a deadline, for whatever reason, whether it's to to make some arbitrary profits or, some deadline because you promised shareholders you would or whatever the case may be. When you are pushed to your limit you remember it more because you're under a lot of stress, your your blood is pumping, you're constantly thinking quickly, and you're trying to be as efficient as possible. And that's what a writer, just a writer in the story or the game development had to do, which is interesting because usually writers, they, they finish their bit, they obsess over every word, they obsess over how it's spoken if there's a voice actor, and they call it a day. It's like, okay, we're done. We did our part. Um, call us for consultation and for lore reasons, but other than that, we are done. And this sounds as if David Gator and and the writing team were always, always involved, as well as with DLC. So, fun, fun times. Other cut narrative threads include connection to Dragon Age Origins, which, I mean, why would you cut that? Arc 3 details tied to the Mage and Templar feud, which was kind of, I would say, a minor point, especially when the Canari was much more interesting and compelling a conflict. And the end battle for Orsino, uh, yeah, that seemed kind of forced. Naturally, there's also the entire Exalted March DLC, which never saw the light of day. And of course, a Varric romance, because Mary Kirby took that slimy car salesman character we'd planned and did the impossible with him. Okay, now here's a point I'm like, okay, do we need this? 
we look at Varric as a character. I think all the characters are attractive in their own rights, and that's pretty much all you need in a story. An attractive character, whether they're flat or round, that will add more depth to them, that will make them more attractive, but are they attractive as is? And I would say all the characters are reasonably attractive, entertaining, funny, fun, broody, you name it. There's something for everyone in the Dragon Age world, or Dragon Age 2 world. So I think Varric works perfectly fine without being romanceable. I think his culture as a dwarf and his love for Bianca, which we don't know what that meant in Dragon Age 2 until we got to Dragon Age 3, or Inquisition rather, and that was fine. He remains a very loyal friend, and he is the the frame narrator of Dragon Age 2, which is interesting because that's how it was connected. I, I actually like that element. I don't think you'd want to have the frame narrator be intimately inferred with Hawk. I don't think that's a wise decision. The problem with Dragon Age 2 is every bloody character was bisexual, if, in case I, I'm... Well, okay, there's there's a few that aren't, but the majority are. So, <laughs> which is funny because we just came from a video yesterday on the Smudcast talking about bisexuality should be in every story and every character should be bisexual, even though the uh, YouTuber said, no, it shouldn't, but then he recanted his words. So this is an example where you can make the argument for bisexuality in a narrative. And I'm surprised he didn't use it, but I think Varric is perfectly fine as entertaining and as a frame narrator in the way he was presented. He did not need to have his perversions or his sexuality or this or that. That's not important. I think Hawk was enough of a womanizing uh, slut, if you were, if we put it nicely. <laughs> Ask about broader story changes. Uh, he would have taken out that thing where Meredith gets the idol. Okay, it was forced on me because she needed to be superpowered with Red Lyrium for her final battle. Being crazy, however, robbed her side of the Mage Templar argument of any legitimacy. I hated, hated, hated that. Now, there's nothing wrong with someone being possessed by some magical force. That's fine. The problem is you're exposing how Red Lyrium works, and then we see how Red Lyrium works later in Dragon Age Inquisition, and the whole lore is thrown out the door. So Dragon Age 2 may as well not have even happened. The only problem I see with this is the superpowered element. So having Meredith being controlled by Red Lyrium, if it was like a, a, a an indoctrination thing where it's slowly creeping up on you, makes perfect sense. That's fine. The idol was never really that big a piece of Lyrium anyway. The problem becomes when she turns into a Power Ranger and she has to be the final boss because video game logic. That's the problem. That became silly. And then you have all those weird uh, statues that pop out of the the wall that are also Power Ranger warrior. It's just it's these golem like it's just stupid. That should not have happened. So, yeah, uh, make her possessed, make her be influenced by the Red Lyrium idol, but don't turn it into a sword. Don't make her turn into a weird, angry woman jumping around and smacking you with it as a as a final boss that's just silly and there's lots of lots of better things that could have been done with dragon age 2 especially choosing which side because th the sides made no difference in the end it really made no difference whether you chose this or that group whether you ch you fought or, or, or fought against orsino it, it, very little difference if any and the, the ending boss was just silly so don't it, it comes down to don't do stupid shit just because video game or time. They could have simplified that boss battle to be not as epic and big and fighting a big creature. On one hand, Dragon Age 2 existed to fill a hole in the release schedule. Yep. Uh, fitting closer discussions discussing the game's rush development. More time was never in the cards. Dragon Age 2 was originally planned as an expansion. Really? That's strange. I never heard that before. Can you imagine Dragon Age 2 being a DLC to Dragon Age Origins? That does not make any sense. On the other, if we had more time, would we have started doing that thing where we second-guess iterate ourselves into mediocrity? Un unfortunately, that's kind of what happened. If you look at Dragon Age 2, the, the quality of the assets, the reused assets, 
the, uh, the the need to jump to DLC to explain some stuff to make bridging DLC to whatever Inquisition was going to be at the time. Uh, the lack of connection to Origins. The cameos for the sake of it. Like these are dumb things. These are bad inclusions. These are not proper plot developments. When a third party like the Kuhn comes in and steals the show based on based on their plot and their plight and what they want to do as opposed to the rise to power, which we never got from Hawk. We never got the rise. To, what power did Hawk gain? He got his ancestral home back. Great. The thing you always were owed, you got it. It's not a rise to power. That's a reclaiming of what was already yours. So that's not a rise. You wanted to see a, a rags to riches story. Something where they learned and grew as a character. Hawk never grew. And that's kind of the fault of the game design of the, the wheel system in Dragon Age 2. But the wheel system did, did give us the purple hawk, which we'll always say is, is the one shining diamond out of all this uh, mediocrity of Dragon Age 2. I will say the, the friend rivalry system, I think that's what it was called, was a very good. Like that, was, that worked out very well, surprisingly, because I was having a few moments where I was like, this is silly. Why would he hate me? He'd still be my friend. And it's like, oh, we're part of the same team, but we're working together even though we hate each other's guts. Like there's a respect that's gained through your rivalry systems, which I thought were brilliant. Anyway, the rest of it was crap, unfortunately. <laughs> so interesting stuff. Dragon Age 2 is about to just be an extension or expansion of Dragon Age Origins. Wow. Anyway, thanks for listening, folks. Have yourself a great day.